Kota Koto, Kato, hello and welcome to this edition of Sky Sports Playmakers, a course where we catch up with the character or legend of the game. The next gentleman I'm going to talk to today, All Black number 854, is absolutely both of those and I've never met an individual with more passion for more things than Sir John Kerwin. JK, thanks for joining us. I'm intrigued by this conversation. I have no idea where it's going to go. But I suppose where do we start? I, I want to start with I want to start with three things: De La Salle College, Marist, and Auckland Rugby. Those three things. What did they do for you as a rugby player in person? Ah, uh, hey Goldie, nice to nice to be here. Uh, changed my life completely. Changed my vision. Changed what I thought of myself. Uh, so, you know, got to remember De La Salle College, not very good at school. Um, you know, some learning issues that I found out later in my life, but, uh, rugby sort of gave me everything. So De La Salle first 15 halfback and then making the Auckland team. And obviously John Hart had a big part of that. He was a mutual friend of ours. Uh, and then the whole world just opened up. And so I, I wouldn't be half the person. I am today without those scary often moments where you're forced to change and forced to look at yourself and forced to to take an opportunity, you know? What did club rugby mean in the 1980s? What did Auckland rugby mean, given the fact that we know that maybe the enemy of the whole of the country, because you guys had got so good, I mean, what it what did it mean for you? What did the club scene mean for you? Uh, the club scene was belonging. Um, back in our day, you had a club and mainly had it for life, unless you, you know, moved towns. Um, for me, being brought up in the in the Catholic faith, it was a pretty easy decision to go to Marist. So for me, it was about that belonging. And really, um, the beautiful thing about club rugby back then was no one was any different. And then if you got selected to Auckland, it was just this, oh, you know, you're sitting around a changing room and there's the builder, the, the, the lawyer, you know, all the different professions. And if you were good at, at rugby, then you got selected to the, to the next level, but you kept coming back. I mean, um, we'd train uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays with Maris and we'd train Monday, Monday Wednesday with Auckland. And I remember playing one of my first test matches against France in 1984 and flying back Sunday morning and playing for Marist on Sunday afternoon. And that's just what you did. You know, that wasn't anything uh, anything out of the norm. Let's talk about the juggernaut, though, that was Auckland rugby in the late 80s and early 90s and as well through the mid-90s in terms of super rugby. I mean... Um... Did it feel like a juggernaut at the time? Did you feel as though the rest of the country was against you? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was, was. I don't think there was, there's a lot more animosity at the moment, I think, uh, against Auckland. Uh, but, yeah, at the time, I think, John Hart, I, I believe that great sides um, see the future and understand what the game might look like and then... Um, select accordingly and I, I certainly think John Hart felt that the game needed to go through a transition and that transition was keeping the ball alive um, you know it was really easy for me because he just gave me one job just stay on your feet and hand it off to people like Michael Jones you know in my first year um, the Iceman wasn't there but that was his vision his vision was to keep the game going make people run a lot more, wear down the opposition. Um, and so I think what he did have was a vision, and then we all bought into that. And then we had this balance of young and old, which I think is really, really important at the time. And a lot of us were um, impatient. We wanted to be the best in the world. We wanted to take this opportunity to to sort of better ourselves. And, and so I think it was that sort of dynamic combination. Uh, we'd go around the country and there was a there was a love hate for sure you know but that just motivated us and when you look around yeah. auckland you know, it's been interesting we get criticized because a lot of the people sitting around that change room weren't for from auckland so so which players set the tone when you first got on the team which guys were the ones that you knew were the ones that had the mana that that you had to follow or the ones that maybe you had to stand up to and challenge from time to time 
Oh, Andy Hayden was an amazing influence in my early years. And, um, you know, he really shaped the way I thought totally against, totally against anything that, that was, uh, you know, that he didn't feel was right or correct ahead of his time from professionalism point of view. So he was a professional back then, um, just trying to hide it in case he didn't get uh, banned. Really, really opinionated, really, really strong personality. So you had to stand up to him. Otherwise, you know, you would, um, you, you'd get trodden on. Uh, John Drake, incredibly influential. I mean, my first season, uh, he walks in a month late, right? And he's been living in France. And, you know, he was the first prop that really acted like a back, you know, like loved the good things in life. And he was telling me about France. And so he was incredibly inf influential. Um, my good mate Fitzy would sort of come up the grades together. Um, you know, I was I was the butcher and he was the builder, you know. Um, and so we, we had this common drive. So he was very good for me to have um, by my side. Grant Fox completely demanding uh, him and i are absolutely great mates but two different personalities just demanding excellence every single day joe stanley you know um one of the first sort of fantastic pacifica players of note probably after brian williams and you know he brought very much a a different look at it so uh lindsey harris one of the greatest <laughs> fullbacks i ever played with goldie and yeah. just a really really interesting character so it was made up with all and i'm leaving out all of them because i think yeah. back then yeah. you know there was there was no um there was no one thing that happens with professional players now is they get institutionalized right so they they know how they should do they know what they should say you often see it in the media but you also see it um, you know, as as humans, and it's not their fault. It's just what I call being institutionalized. There was none of that, you know, yeah. none of that. Now that everyone had their opinion, everyone had an argument. There was nothing personal about it, but it was just way more dynamic. And we're still arguing with Foxy now. Let's be honest; he's yeah. still demanding. It's just the, the nature of, like you say, players and people don't change. You talk about the good life. While you're doing this, though, you started to spend some off seasons in Treviso and in Italy. And your good friend Craig Green was there. And, and let's talk about that, about how that maybe has shaped not just um, your culture and understanding of so many things, but also your personal life. Was that, I mean, was that probably one of your best memories of the game, was was making that trip overseas? Oh, there it is. See that? <laughs> well, I That's can see my that. Italian passport. <laughs> yeah. So... There, there I go. I'm an Italian citizen, believe that or not, you know, from Mangari to just outside Venice. Yeah, look, I think um, <laughs> it was an incredible time. So I actually went before, so 89, I, we won the competition uh, and there I was with Craig Green, but I actually went in uh, 1985 when I was 20 and it was the most, um, it was a really tough time. It was a, it was an interesting journey. I'm at training one night and um, you know, up in the field, there's this guy um, who's probably dressed like I was. I'm dressed like I dress now, Goldie. You know, he had jeans on, a shirt. A, a, yeah, yeah, he had. He, he, and then the guy standing next to him was in jeans and a jacket, and he had long hair and in a ponytail, right? So this is this is 1985. And after training, they came up to him and they said, "Oh, JK, we'd like you to come to Italy." And I went, "Wow, yeah, that's really interesting." And um, we've got a budget of three thousand dollars, right? I was earning six hundred dollars for my dad a month, and they had three thousand dollars a month, right? So I'm getting a hundred and fifty bucks a week or whatever it was, um, and that was ninety ninety in normal pay. And then I ha then I was boning beef at ten dollars yeah. a body to make extra money, right? So three thousand bucks. I go straight home to dad and go, you know. These guys, Dad, are going to pay me three thousand dollars a month to go and play rugby, and Dad said, "What they look like?" And I went, uh, "Well, one was dressed in jeans and had a blazer on, and the other one had long hair and a ponytail." He said, "Don't trust the bastards, mate." <laughs> <laughs> I thought he might have said so, cash up front. I thought he might have said, "Yeah, yeah exactly." <laughs> so he said, "You need to do way more research because you know that's uh, 
that's a pretty big risk. So I go and do a whole lot more research. And how it came about was early, um, you know, early in the piece, sort of 72, 73, early 80s, players were starting to go. And a very good friend of mine who was an outstanding number eight for Auckland, tough as nails, um, is a guy called Glenn Rich. And he'd been over there and um, they were friends of his and they wanted me to go. And so you know, I did all this research and I went home and I said to dad, dad, you know, um, it's true. They actually work for the Benetton company. The Benetton family is one of the biggest clothing companies in Europe. Um, so the money's real and it's pretty much guaranteed. And he went, okay, I think you should go, but that's too much money for you. So you can take your sister and your brother-in-law and give them half. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> but, so that's what I did. So my brother-in-law, John Arkoy, who played for Samoa, yeah. he came and played for the local, uh, another local club, um, gave them half the money. And, <laughs> and that's when I got introduced to, to, to clothes and wine. And, you know, it was just like this. Um, I, I went over there the first time and... Um, so you got to remember, brought up in Mangere, uh, meat and three vegetables, son of a butcher, a butcher. So, you know, there's not a lot of vegan discussions in our house. She was meat and three veggies. Uh, Dad would come home and have a lion, lion red in the evening or, yeah. um, you know, a whiskey on, on the rocks. And mum would have a cook chasseur out, out of the cask, you know. Yeah. So I fly into Venice and I get picked up and I have this amazing dinner. Where they start with a, you know, pivo, the, the first course, then the second course, then the third course, and then the second, third course, and then the next course. <laughs> and every course, uh, they're, they're bringing out wine. And I'm going, wow, this is like, I've, I've died and gone to heaven. And I won't even mention the amount of, of beautiful people I saw uh, once I got to the airport. So we won't even go there. But, um, and I thought, man, that was beautiful of them to put on that sort of spread and, you know, that dinner and sort of go through that process with me. It wasn't anything to do with me, mate. It was like that every night. But, so. but that's obviously changed you because if you go to the Kerwin household now, that's the experience that you want to pass on to everyone else. Was that that one decision, that one opportunity, was that well and truly life-changing? Oh, Totally. Totally life changing, and I completely fell in love with the culture, with the people, with the way they did things, uh, with the way they showed emotion. You know, like it was, it was just this amazing transformation for me. And like I, my family is in a city at the moment. I spoke to them yesterday. I said, "How was your day?" And they said, "Well, you know, we 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 had lunch, and these people came round, and then other people came round, and anyway, lunch ended up being dinner, and so they were at the dinner table from one till ten. So, depending on the quality of the food, that's just actually how we entertain and how we stay together as a family, and how the Italians really live. And I I just fell in love with that, and um, I came back, and people would say things like. What are, you, what are you doing, JK? Like, you know, you're risking your all-black career. You're only 20. Why are you going? And I was going, are you kidding me? Like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. Um, and so for me, it was just something that I really wanted to have in my life. They, they wouldn't let me go um, the following year because World Cup was coming up. So they all just sort of said to me as the as the you know, if you go, okay, we won't pick you for the World Cup. So I didn't go um, 87, and then I couldn't go at the end of 87. So Craig Green, Green went, and then I went in 89, and we won the championship, and then I went back 1991, 92. And it's almost like Craig Green hasn't left, right? Craig, <laughs> I spoke to Greeno yesterday. I spoke to Greeno yesterday. Um, yeah, he's still there. He's he's we we have a we have a group of old players from Benetton who. Um, Giorgio Piazza, so Giorgio Piazza, Piazza means square, um, yep. so we actually call him Giorgio Square, and he's got a vineyard, and every year we used to go there and um, just try every vat, basically, and have a massive meal, and they were doing that the other night, so I was pretty uh, pretty sad not to be there, but Greeno was there representing me, as he does. <laughs> <laughs> so I know from experience you're competitive, but... Were you always that passionate about things before you started to experience 
or was it in New Zealand because we didn't do things like that? Did that all of a sudden bring out and change your personality a little bit in terms of that passion, or was it just more from the competitiveness to a passion and drive? It's a great question, Goldie, because I've often I I often take time to reflect and. Reflection is something that gets taken away from us in the modern world. So actually sitting down and reflecting and, you know, I've been reflecting about what you and I do on the breakdown and, and sometimes how I'm so passionate and opinionated and, and how that could offend or rub people up the wrong way. Um, but I was this incredibly shy, uh, South Auckland boy who didn't really like himself, who, um, was full of doubt and, and I was lucky that I had the ability of, of rugby. And I think going through, especially my illness, I came out the other end um, saying that I want to be values-based, but I also want to be passionate about something and more, not just one thing, but many things. And if I'm passionate about it, I want to be able to have discussions because I don't think I'm right. Um, but when I, when I have an opinion, I get really passionate about it. And then if the other person pushes back, then I reflect and will change, as you will know, because you and I have often had those <laughs> yes. discussions. Um, but I also I also don't think you can't go you can't go through life without um, having passions. And I think having more than one passion is important because it gives your life um, balance. You know, one thing that scares me about rugby is empathy, right? Um, if people don't care, then that's the beginning of the death of your game. And and I'm really passionate about us having opinions. And, and I don't believe um, that I'm right in any way, but I will be passionate about that decision and, and arguing it, hoping that I'm going to get that relationship back. I mean, you know, it's never personal for me, but I love a good discussion about yep. almost anything. Yep, you should Because do. that... Yeah, because that gives me human connection. It gives me um, a different idea. It, it means that other person's got just a strong view, and I think that's really healthy. But so not in our culture, at, right? Well, it's and no, well, it's sort of it, in some ways we like to be understated. We like to sit back. Um, but I'm with you. I do love a great debate and discussion. And you know, people will forever ask me what Sir John Kerwin like, and I, and I give him exactly what you've just said about the fact that you like to challenge, you like to understand, you like to study. You look, and the great thing about it is when we get in a debate and a discussion, you're not afraid to then admit, maybe I'm wrong here, or I need to change my thought processes on something, which I think is really, really important. And when people ask me about you, and I, we tend to talk about your All Black career, and we talk about for example, let's talk about the All Blacks then. Say 19, 1987, you win a Rugby World Cup. Is that your greatest moment as an All Black or is there something else besides that that stands out as being more important? Um, I, it's, it's, like I have, uh, it's like I have a past that's not me. I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but I actually do not look too far into the, into the past. Like... Um, I think there were some really defining moments in my life. You know, one of them was getting picked out of the third grade and, and you know, what, what, what we talked about in the beginning. Another incredibly big moment in my life was going to live in Italy when I was 20. Um, another incredible moment in my life was winning the World Cup in 1987, but being part of the first World Cup, that accelerated. 1989, um, win the championship for Benetton after 50 odd years uh, and also meet my wife. So, you know, incredible moment. And, and the interesting thing that glues us all together is rugby. That's why, I've, you know, I, I owe the game so much. Um, you know, I had my first sort of major three week anxiety attack breakdown in Italy at the beginning of that season. Um, finished the season, greatest night of my life. I'm in love. Um, and I, I start heading back to New Zealand. I'm in Venice Airport. I walk through customs. They've got guns and all that sort of stuff. Have a massive anxiety attack and um, related that anxiety attack to New Zealand and the pressure I was under in New Zealand. So I decided never to come back. Turned around, uh, went back out, 
uh, got through customs, believe it or not, went back out and there was no one there. <laughs> so all the people that had dropped me off had left, as you do. Um, so yeah. they'd gone. Yeah. And we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. So I just turned around and, and came back to New Zealand. And, and so that those sort of next four or five years were incredible, um, you know, sort of moments in my life that really shaped me. Um, and, and I think for me, one of my biggest fears in life, Goldie, is I don't want to ever stop growing. And I want to continue to challenge myself to change and to be different and and make sure that I'm growing because it, it's all those moments in my life, some of them I wouldn't want to repeat, have always and continue to be uh, making who I am today. And I don't think that should stop because of age. So I'm always pushing to try and find new moments and new experiences that uh, TV was one, mate. I mean, you know, I think another really big moment in my life was, you know, the complete failure at the blues. Um, and people say, oh, JK, it wasn't failure. Well, in our industry, it was, you know, you've got to win. If you don't win, you get the sack. And I resigned an hour before they sacked me, um, which is just good for the CV. But yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, another incredible moment in my life. Um, reflection, scary, don't know what I'm going to do, um, you know, and then came and and did some stuff with you, really scary, never been much on TV before. You were amazing. You do an amazing job. You really helped me sort of settle in. Um, but then okay, JK, are you going to be you on the TV show or are you just going to be a talking head? So all these moments in my life that have often been scary at the time continue to make me grow and, and expand, which is, did that answer your question? Yeah, we're always going to get to that point. You go, what was the question again? And, and, and I, so I love that about the fact because I, I agree with you entirely that, you know, it feels like a lifetime ago. We quite often get asked whether or not, oh, do you miss it? We both agree we don't miss it, I think. We, we see what they do out there now and we go, you know what? That's not the game that we played and we've moved on to other things. Do we miss it? Could, you know, If we could play, would we? I don't know. I, 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 I may, I may not, but I look at it and, and you're right. They were, I mean, I've, I went and did other things and been part of other things, which I felt that I've probably got more growth out of as a person, an individual, and been able to challenge myself in different ways. You know, So, so when you leave... Uh, the rugby environment when you left, did you just know it was time? Did you think to yourself, you know what, I need a new challenge? And when it was the Warriors and rugby league, did, a bit like me, was it the I chased the cricket dream? Were, were you just chasing another dream? Yeah, look, I think uh, it's a really good question. It's a hard one to answer. So, um, you know, people often talk to me about failure, and I just don't believe in failure. Um, and that came around, that came about really when I turned down the Warriors for the first time. So I turned down the Warriors for the first time and then I'm lying in bed every night and I'm saying, what if, you know, what if I could make it in rugby? What if, what if, what if? And I remember after two months, you know, saying to my wife, I can't live with what if because what if is way bigger than failure, Right. So I don't want to be my age now, 56. Just imagine if I didn't go, I'm looking back and say, I wish I had done that. What if I had done that? And so that, and then uh, Michael Jordan had just been through his softball experience. Yeah, and yeah. I did a bit of research on that. And I read an amazing article from him, which was pretty much similar. And so that was another pivotal time in my life. And, and you know, if you morph that to when I finished with the Blues, um, so two things, I don't believe in failure because I believe they're learnings because if you don't fail, then you're never, you're never pushing yourself to try and be, you know, this, this person that you want to be. So there's no such thing as what if, and then if failure is a learning, what did you learn from it? Um, I have no regrets. The only, the only little regret that I have, and as I continue to grow and try and get better and better is looking back and at the mistakes I made as a rugby coach, right? Um, at some of the things I did that I think were more ego driven than ability driven, you know, trying, trying to do things that aren't really your strengths, right? Um, and then trying to cover that with things that you shouldn't. So, so the, those types of things 
a, a incredible learning. So not failures and failure motivates me because once I've failed, I know that there's so many learnings there. If I listen, I think the hardest thing across all these um, decisions and, you know, doing TV was another one. Um, doing the mental health ads many years ago was how do you talk to your ego? You know, which part of this is good ego and which part of this is bad ego? And I think I continue to um, question that, you know, JK, do you do this because you actually like the fame or don't you like the fame? Where's your ego sit in that? What is that driving you? Are you being egotistical about this opinion or is it actually opinion that you've done a little bit of research about, you reflected it on yourself and you've got the courage and the confidence to, to back that up? And I still make those mistakes sometimes because I get passionate about things very quickly without thinking about them. And that's why sometimes, you know, I'll say to you, yeah, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong, um, because I didn't actually go through that process, which, that, I mean, I'm not worried about it. It's just, just as yeah, the, the nature of, of the positions you've been in where you've had responsibility and you've been trying to lead that that uh, belief and confidence that you're trying to give to other people, like you say, you have to demonstrate yourself. And like you say, that that ego of, okay, do I have to have all of the answers? I remember when I was coaching the same, uh, you know, when, when I transitioned across, it was very, very similar. The fact that you thought you were, you know, if you felt as though you were close to the answer, you'd give your opinion on it rather than, you know, and I remember when Liam Barry, um, I did some coaching with him and he's now with the New Zealand Sevens team and doing a fantastic jobs job with them. I mean, he talked to me about the fact that if you don't have an answer, just say, I, I, actually, I, I'll, I'll go away and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk to somebody about that and I'll get back to you, you know, and give yourself that opportunity. And, and I mean, you talk about coaching, you, you coach the Azuri, you coach the Brave Blossoms, Japan, Italy, and the Blues. I mean, I mean, were those still, you talk about all those, that learning that you did. I mean, were they, were they really important parts of your life? And, and like you say, we all have the benefit of hindsight. We have done things differently. But were they as experiences for you still something special you will hold on to? Oh, all of them. All of them were, were amazing. And just getting back to that leadership question um, that, that you mentioned, you know, leadership is grey. It's not black and white. So when you are deciding in grey, there are going to be mistakes made. And I think, you know, Liam, who's also a good mate of mine, um, you know, is right. If you don't know, you should fess up. Or if you are trying to push the boundaries, you need to take everyone with you, right? Um, but when you talked about growing situations, you know, I remember going to see my dad and saying, Dad, I've got an opportunity to go and play rugby in Japan, right? So this is very, very early days in you know, what Japan was. So no one knew anything about Japan. There were a few players. Joe Stanley was up there. Uh, there was a few players up there, but it was still pretty in its infancy. Um, and I remember going to saying, gee, I never thought I'd play in Japan, you know. And he said to me, you know, son, at my age, so he would have been probably 75 or 78. He said, uh, when you look back on life at my age, three years is nothing. So whether it's a good or bad experience, when you're at my age, it'll be an experience, right? And so um, that gave me the courage to go and do that. And it was the most amazing time of my life. Still got great mates there. So then I think one of the things I'm really passionate about doing um, with my new company, Mentimere, is actually creating something for players that are about to finish. Because you would have faced this and you asked me this question before. You know, why the Warriors? Um, I was probably bored in rugby. I probably should have done what Tana did and gone from from you know from wing to centre to try and challenge myself. You know, I was getting a bit old and a bit bitter. Um, so the challenge of the Warriors was amazing. The challenge of of um, of going to Japan was amazing. But then at the end of that, I didn't know what I was going to do. Right. So I'm a butcher. I know I'm not going to have to do that. You know yeah. what I mean? And, yeah. um, I don't, I'd only been a pro for five years. So I'd had two years with the Warriors and then three years in Japan. So um, I was very disciplined in those years. And so I, you know, I paid off a mortgage. So 
I didn't, um, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of debt, but I didn't have any income. So what do you bloody do? And I think this is really, really difficult for players because we are 35 and we have been the best of what we do, um, regardless of what level you get to, because anyone who plays professionally is the best of what they do, whether you make the All Blacks or not, you're the best of what you do. And so how do you become the best at something else? And what is that? And that is a really, really scary time. And I only knew uh, one thing, and that was that was rugby. And I got the opportunity to go into management um, with the Blues, with Gordy Hunter, good mate of yours, and yeah. and um, you know that was that was an incredible roller coaster ride as well. I was manager; he got unwell. There's a whole lot of things going on in the background that were. It was a roller incredible. coaster to play for him as well. <laughs> it was a roller coaster <laughs> to play for him as well. He was a beautiful man, yeah. but I'm sure you had your challenges. Yeah. But anyway, all those moments, you know, all those moments that keep pushing you. Um, but then coaching the Italian side was an absolutely amazing experience. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd had a group of young guys who were really passionate and we had a hell of a lot of fun. Um, we won some really important games that kept me for there a few years. And then, you know, I went for the, at the end of that, I went for the Japanese job, um, you know, and the American job at the same time and chose the Japanese job. And that was just a fantastic experience. I was really disappointed um, with the way we performed uh, in the World Cup here in New Zealand. We should have beaten France at North Harbour Stadium. And there was a couple of things in that game where if things had have gone a little bit different, it would have been a special moment and the players deserved it. But that was an amazing growth. You know, we went from 18th in the world to 11th. I learned a lot about myself and coaching um, and so those years coaching were fantastic. Coming home to the Blues, you know, I loved it for two and a half years. The last probably half year wasn't great, but I really, really enjoyed being back in New Zealand and having a crack. It was my goal and dream. And I think, you know, often my, my kids will ask me, you know, Dad, what, you know, what if we don't make this team or make that team? But, you know, I think understanding your level and having a crack is way better than, like I said before, saying what if, you know. My goals were to be the best coach that I could be coming back to New Zealand, um, coaching the Blues and making them successful would put me in that top rung. Didn't work out, but hey, I knew my level. And looking back, I know exactly my level. Um, you know, if I ever got back into coaching, which won't happen, I'd know exactly what to do. And I think that's really important. A lot of coaches after their failure, I think in coaching, you can have two failures, right? You can, you can, you can't have three. You know, like I, I love Jose uh, Moringo, who's who's obviously been um, an amazing coach. You know, Chelsea, Portugal, uh, Man United, Tottenham, and now he's in Rome. Um, and I was talking to someone the other day, and they're saying, you know, it's an important season for him to win because he's been the most amazing coach. But if you have two failures in a row, it's really hard to get back. So a lot of coaches have left the Blues and got incredibly great knowledge out of it and gone on to be great um, coaches, you know. Except Do you, you miss me. it, though? Do you miss it? Oh, I'm saying that because, uh, well, you got rid of me, which is probably in some ways, I talk about it in hindsight, you know, um, it's probably the best thing that ever happened. It presented me with a different opportunity, a different challenge. Um, and so you think about that. Um, but do you miss that side of it? Because if there's one thing, you know, there's something special for me and always was, but when you're part of that team, when you're part of that insider sporting team, which rides the emotions, which you do as a rugby coach every single week. And um, when we're seeing Leon McDonald go through that with this Blues team right now, do you miss elements of that? And, and you know, we don't miss sometimes the losing, but just that camaraderie, that changing room, um, because it is a special place to be. No. You, they don't. Um, no. I think my ego does. Yeah. I think my ego does. You know, I miss, I miss being centre stage. I miss being in that competitive environment. I miss, you know, all those things you you spoke about: the change room, the camaraderie, um, the inner sanctum. I probably uh, miss a bit of that, but I don't think I had the mental capacity to be a coach. Um, I don't think I could switch off. And I think I cared too much. And that's, I'm not saying that the, 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 the coaches at the highest level don't care because I think they do, but I think they have a ability 
to compartmentalize and leave that where it should be and carry on with life. I'd stay awake at night. Uh, I'd be worrying about individuals. I'd, uh, so um, I don't miss any of that side of it. I, I miss and I'm disappointed that I didn't under, under pressure, I didn't understand um, my incredible strengths and um, really implement them and get then, you know, get the people around me that would really, really help with my, um, really, really help with my sort of, you know, deficiencies. I, I remember, I remember Murray Mixted saying to me very plainly, you know, JK, your problem was you learned how to coach overseas. And if you want to do it in New Zealand, she's a pretty hard road to get where you already are. Um, and the second thing was I came back after being away for 12 years. I didn't know any players. Um, yep. And so there was a whole lot of different things that I would change, I think. But, hey, look, I don't I don't spend – I mean, it's the only time I've thought about it, Goldie, because I just do not look back, you know, like um, – I keep moving forward and, like I said, don't believe in failure. I just believe in learnings and moving on and putting those learnings into other parts of your life. Mate, you mentioned your kids. So Francesca plays professional beach volleyball. She does. Nico plays professional football. And Luke is in a New Zealand junior rower. So they've all got some big engines, obviously. Uh, yeah, no, he just made the elite side yesterday. So, so he's so, – yeah. so, okay. Um, did they all get – the same competitive drive, or has it been? I mean, you talk about that. I mean, those are... <laughs> well, I've I've heard discussions with you and Fiorella, and I tell you what, it's passionate. There's no doubt about that. Um, but if you if you think about you know the path that they've gone down, and these are not easy sports to play. These are challenging sports. Um, I mean, what's your advice been to them, uh, and and how have you found it, knowing that they are feeling pressure of sorts? different pressure to what you've felt and how have you helped them grow into the sports they're playing well i'm incredibly proud of of the people they are firstly um i genuinely love my kids and like them um <laughs> if you can have both of those things francesca francesca is an incredible young woman she is running our wine business but also new zealand volleyball champ um, tried to qualify for the Olympics, missed out, now in Europe. Um, and she is just an incredibly motivated and driven uh, uh, person who also is a fantastic daughter. So that's all you can ask for, right? Um, and Nico, my son, who plays football, never picked up a rugby ball in his life. Uh, he's done an amazing job you know, had a tough time here in New Zealand in the initial stages when I brought him back from Italy. And then a bit like me when I was 20, he just got on a plane and trialed and, and it's been a really tough road for him, but he's hung in there and, um, you know, he's getting some success now, which is fantastic. And Luca, who was playing rugby, but then chose rowing, that is the hardest sport in the world. Anyone who rows, you guys got to go well. So I think the message that we had as parents is, you know, we would never take, we, we, we felt as parents that sport was as important as education from a learning point of view, right? So we felt that, um, for example, if they're not doing well at school, we're not going to take their sport off them, right? Why would you do that? Um, and also we just encourage them to be the best that they can be. And what does that look like? So keep pushing. And what, what often happens was, um, you know, that the, they hit a bit of a wall and want to change direction or, you know, start lacking a bit of confidence. We would try and encourage them to, to push through that, right. And make sure that they challenge themselves. Um, I think competitiveness uh, you know, both Farella and I are competitive. She's probably more competitive than me. And so I think that's genetics. I think the hardest thing, um, it's not been hard for us to motivate them to try and be the best. Self-doubt, uh, believing in yourself, all those types of things are all all things that I and Farella, we try and help with because I think those are the things that, you know, especially I suffered from, um, you know, and how you how you try and educate your kids from a sporting point of view about some of the stuff that you went through. It's, it's 
very different to parenting, I believe. Um, there's yeah. parenting and, and core values and discipline and things that we have an expectation around. Um, and then there's actually trying to parent a child around their sport. And I think they're very different, different uh, techniques and not easy if you have been to a certain level. You know, I remember saying to Nico once who um, was on the bench and I said, well, mate, I can't advise you because I was always picked. Um, and, you know, this, I don't want that to sound arrogant, but it was the truth. So I was really, really fortunate. Like I always got picked. And I remember reacting incredibly badly, like when I was 32 and, and they dropped me in Japan. I acted like a spoiled little shit, right? So yeah. I, I could not advise. I could not advise on what he needed at the time from a sports point of view. But, um, you know, it's one of the most exciting things I have in my life is watching my kids play sport. I think it's just one of the greatest things that, uh, that you can do as a parent. But yeah, you know. It's always exciting when, you're, when, when I hear you talk about the fact you, you're heading down Start Highway 1 and then you're heading towards he and you know you've got your crew of guys there that you're going to go and... Is that where you go and check out? You go to the batch, you know, I know half of uh, the Waikato and, and former players have all moved out there and the Smitty's around. and I mean, but in saying that, when you get there, do you still get sucked into a little bit of rugby talk, a little bit of rugby chat and, you know, the, the wow. fact that... You know, because because that's the, the familiarity. Warren Gats Get, is around. You know, you think about the people. Um, but for you, is that where you talk about family and friends and escaping, you know, all of this seriousness of life? There's a beautiful word, word in Maori called ukaipo. And I believe um, directly translated, it might mean something like breastfeeding or something like that. But it also has another meaning of where you belong. Um, and when I was, when I was creating, um, the JK foundation and the program mighty to go into school, we, we did it on, the, we did it on, um, on some of the Maori, uh, sort of ways of well being. And this word ukaipo came up and when, um, the lady that built this program explained it to me, she said, um, I feel ukaipo when, I see my land, which is up north. Um, when I come over the hill and I see my land, I feel automatically at home and at peace. And why he is like that for me. I come down the hill and I see the the sea and the 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 Waihi town or Waihi Beach Township in front of me, and I automatically feel at home and at peace. And I think that's a really, really special um really really special feeling and something and i actually like people say to me you know when i talk about italy i talk about home and um the my place in italy i feel that that's home as well so i feel really fortunate that i have more than one ukaipo um and so for me when i go to waihi it is about that and and so when i'm at peace but like rugby is in my blood like if i sit there and talk about rugby i'm happy like it's not that i don't want to talk about rugby um yeah. you know and so for me oh, i mean wayne smith's down there you know like he rings me hey i've just got down there and he goes uh what are you doing jack it's saturday afternoon like i'm i'm just chilling man i've had a surf life's good um thinking about what i'm gonna have you know for dinner what sort of wine i'm gonna drink and smithy rings me says what are you doing jack hey and I said, mate, I'm cruising. He said, do you want to come and watch Waihi Beach play? <laughs> Waihi Township? Waihi Athletic play? I've been coaching them. I said, Smithy, are you kidding yourself? Like, are you kidding yourself? And did he you goes, go? no, no. So I went, I went with him. <laughs> it was amazing. Did. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. It was amazing. I saw a whole lot of, of, of Waihi Beach people who I know. Um, Gary, Gary Wetton was there. Uh, John Burns was there. Um, Stephen Barclay was there, all guys that I played with in my era. Yeah. Um, they were there just by chance, you know, and it was just a really cool afternoon. And it, 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 is, it is an integral part of our community that I'm really scared that is starting to break down. Um, you know, so that, that for me was just uh, a great day.
but but also I do like to get down there and I don't watch TV. I don't you know, sort of get away from it yeah. as well. Yeah. Look, just lastly, I just want to talk about you know obviously you know in in, in more recent years. I mean, you, you've talked about your struggles with mental health, but the the role that you've come to play in New Zealand, the fact that the things that you have to deal with and uh, trying to change on a daily basis. I mean, is that is that now for you in terms of a priority? Has that become your life's priority in terms of the fact that that's how you really want to make a difference is by helping people and helping them cope with like you've talked about some of the things that have changed and and are different in, in, in today's society? Yeah, look, for me, I think um, there's some beautiful people out there who are talking about it and more people talking about, you know, Mike King's doing a great job. I love what he's doing. Jazz Thornton's doing a, you know doing an amazing job. There's a lot of people now out there talking about it. So, you know, I'm really pleased that there's more voices out there. I think, um, you know, I've started, I've done two things. I've started a company called Mentimea, and that's really about well-being in the workplace and delivering that. We want to help 100 million people and save 100,000 lives. Um, and that, for me, delivering well-being into the workplace and mental well-being and psychological well-being is really, really important because I think that we need to learn these tools now, right? We get more inputs in one day today than we um, than our grandparents had in a lifetime. So we've got to learn some of these techniques that I learned by being unwell, um, you know. So that is really, really important for me. And then the other thing that I've created for the JK Foundation is a program called Mighty, which is teaching our children at school um how to learn about the iq and the eq of their mental health and i'm really really passionate about that i've had some beautiful people um, that have given me you know a lot of money and we are now in 20 schools hopefully to be in 70 schools by next year and that is teaching our kids all those tools all the things they need to understand mental health so that they can deal with some of the things that life's going to throw at them um, so, you know, really my goal is prevention and I think that prevention of, of what I went through is what I would like to deliver now. I also think with Mentimea that it needs to be a business. It needs to be a for-profit. I think it's really, really hard to keep asking for money. So the idea about Mentimea is create, um, a business model where businesses get more retention. They get more um, you know, they get better people staying, they get they get more productivity, they get less absenteeism. So things like that, if we can prove mental well-being in the workplace, we'll do that, then it becomes a norm, Goldie, like, it, I don't want it to be this thing, you know, I just want it to be something normal that we all talk about, that we understand, that we educate for, and so that then, um, you know, we can go from one of the worst, uh, you know, suicide and mental health stats in the developed world to the best. So that's my goal, to go from one of the worst to the best. Yeah, and we're grateful for, for all of the time that you put into that. And in fact, I know that for all of those charities that are looking for someone to volunteer to do some sort of physical challenge, so John Kerwin is your man, whether he's biking or swimming. <laughs> he usually puts his hand up every year. He's looking for a new challenge. Have we got one when we come out of lockdown, JK? Is that what we're thinking about? No, well, if I remember last time, there was two people who were brought up in Southland who oh, that's promised right. to do the ride with me next year. But... <laughs> hold on, hold on. You promised that we would do it. I didn't promise. You promised. <laughs> yeah, no, I promised you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, on my behalf, I'm not sure I agreed to that. JK, look, um, we, we have so much admiration. It's, it's a pleasure to work with you because of the fact you bring so much passion to what we do and we love what we do and it's great um, on a weekly basis uh, we get to debate and discuss and try and make people aware and make things in our sport better but you're obviously doing that on a bigger scale so mate always great to have a chat we'll do it on a monday night once again um when the breakdown is on but uh once again thanks very much mate and uh, let's do this again sometime yeah thanks goldie look i think um you know, one of the greatest things in life is friendship. And um, you and I probably didn't know each other that well before we started television, but I've got, I had huge respect for you as a player before, but 
I regard you as a mate now and someone who I can talk to about just about anything. And I think in life, if you can have a professional situation where you end up saying, well, he's a good mate of mine, then I think that is really, really special. So thanks for the thanks for the interview. I forget a lot of these things that we talk about. I just take them as granted in my past and don't talk about them a lot. So it's been a bit of a walk down memory lane for me as well. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a walk. Definitely a good thing. Definitely a good thing. Let's do it again. Cheers, mate.